Hi, guys. Welcome back to My Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today is another fantastic day for an interview. I have got a man today on my show who, like me, has been in the darkness. And he finally saw the light. He is now the light in the darkness of many, many others who are hopeless, helpless. So today we're going to talk about addiction, about recovery, about relapse prevention, all those such important bits which are so, so, ah, oh, insurmountable mountains there, there when we are in the darkness. Yet, when you come to a point like Adam and me, then we look back and think, actually, nah, they are not insurmountable. There are shitloads of paths up these mountains. No one shows you them. Okay, yeah. so Adam Vibe Ganton, thank you so much for coming on to my show, man. Thank you so much for having me, Stefan. I'm excited to be here. Oh, cool. And this morning, we already had quite a few challenges here. We're essentially, what, 20, 25 minutes late. And uh, it just shows the challenges in daily life. They come, if you like them or not. And in this case today, it was technical abilities or technical problems. In other cases, it might be toxic relationships and so on. And, oh, trauma left, right and center. And But nowadays, I am pleased that I've, I've got a different ability to deal with that. There's no longer the shame, the guilt, the resentment. And for that, I'm so, so grateful. But that is a long story. And, and some of the readers or oh, listeners know my story. What about yours? You are in a very same boat, brother. I mean, how did your story start? When did you first get tempted with maybe not so healthy choices? Yeah, I grew up a all-American golden boy. And obviously, you're, you're, a lot of your listeners are in New Zealand, but I'm from the United States. And some of your listeners might have heard of Columbine High School. And that's the community that I grew up in. I was, uh, you know, an all-state wrestler. I won one state championships in Little League, won state for my Little League football team six years in a row, won nationals one year. And I was even the home run derby hitter of the Little League World Series. But when I was 12 years old, an older influence introduced me to cocaine. And then shortly after, I started with marijuana and alcohol, things like that. And I was able to have this successful high school career at Columbine High School with my sports. I was captain of the football team when we won state my senior year. I was captain of the wrestling team, all state and all these things. But I had this hidden drug habit that I didn't realize where it was taking me. And a lot of the authorities in my life, the coaches and the parents and things like that, were not able to see these problems because I was putting off this really good facade of who I was to the community. and that you know, progressed into, you know, mushrooms and ecstasy and things like that, experimenting, having fun, partying, drinking every weekend. But then I went off to college. And on September 28th, 2008, I had been out partying and drinking like most nights my freshman year of college, when I woke up to my phone ringing and vibrating down by my leg. And I swam through the soft sheets to find my hard phone with the bright screen that read 4.47 a.m. And my best friend Chucker was calling me. And I remember having the conscious choice that I could either answer the phone like I always do with, hey, what's up, Chuck? Or I could answer the way I was feeling with, "Ugh, hello. And in my still drunken state, I chose the latter, to which a soft voice replied, hey, what's up? Why are you calling me this late? I was just calling to say hi. Don't call me this late again. And I hung up on him. And he shot himself. And for nearly a decade after that experience, I was unable to share it with anyone as I bottled it down deeper and deeper and deeper with drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol were no longer a way to party and have fun. At that moment, drugs and alcohol became my solution to life. I was consciously using drugs and alcohol after that to mask the way I felt, mask the way I thought, be able to go into social situations and feel like I was a part of because during that situation, right after his suicide, Everyone was consoling me. Everyone was hugging me and loving me because he was my best friend. I'm so sorry this happened, Adam. And this whole time, I'm thinking in my head that I killed him. I was the one that did this, but I couldn't share it with anyone. So this progressed and progressed. 
And shortly after that experience, I found Oxycontin. And Oxycontin was like a godsend for me at the time because it literally would just erase everything going on in my life. It would make all of my thoughts go away. It would make my whole body numb. It would make my emotions go away, my feelings go away as long as I was high on it. And then shortly after finding it, I was able to procure a prescription from a doctor for 250 milligrams a day when I was 19, 20 years old. And that progressed from there. I was not only using 250 milligrams a day, so I started having to get other people's prescriptions. I started having to do different things to get these prescriptions. And then when all the wave came in about Oxycontin and it got popular about doctors not being able to uh, prescribe it, you know, my doctor cut me off. And there was no plan. There was no, you know, let's wean you off. None of that. Hey, are you addicted to this? None of that stuff. It was just cut off. So then I had to move to the streets, start using heroin. And that progressed from smoking it and snorting it to obviously I went to IV drug use. And during this time, I was always able to kind of keep that facade. You know, people were recognizing more and more the more time they spent with me that I was a drug addict. But I was able to build companies, I was able to go out and do sales, I was able to, you know, put off this, this value to the people around me by my abilities of going door to door. And in that time, the corporations that I worked for, they would pay for your housing, they would pay for your bills, they would pay for your insurance and your phone and everything. And then I would get a check every week, because I was able to produce, I was able to stay in the top 10. That got to a point in 2015, on November 6th, I was in Billings, Montana, and I was up there doing door to door sales. And I had a girlfriend at the time and I went over to her aunt's place where she was staying and went and saw her. And at the time, I was kind of lying to her, you know, not telling her that I was doing drugs like that anymore. I said I was on a break from them, that kind of stuff. We spend some time together and then I leave a little bit after midnight and I tell her I have to go back to my hotel and sleep for work tomorrow. Go around the corner, I make up a shot, I put it in my arm, and the first thing I thought was I'm I'm you know I'm pissed because it's bunk I don't feel anything and then the next thing I know after I start driving off I'm waking up on the asphalt in a pile of glass with blue and red lights all around me and police and and ambulances and things like that and I realized like I've just overdosed and that still wasn't enough and we can go into the topic if we want to but I was sick I was very sick at the time I was not out menacing. I was not committing crimes to get my drugs or anything, but they found a very small amount of drugs on me, obviously personal amount. And I was charged with a felony. And four months later, uh, my my attorney and I had done some, some plans for the case and everything. We were kind of confident because it was an illegal search and seizure, that kind of stuff. And we're sitting in court for a preliminary hearing. First thing the DA does is pull out and wheel out a 52 inch television screen in front of me and the whole court pushes play and it's body cam footage of a police officer finding me slumped over my steering wheel not moving not breathing no pulse he breaks in he pulls me out and in that courtroom I looked into my own eyes without spirit and without a soul in them so I see my own dead body, what this addiction was doing to me. And I start crying in that courtroom, thinking, how am I doing this till my life? How am I going to lose everything that I've ever worked for and just die? And I'm looking at myself and that still isn't enough. I still can't stop. But that started, that started another journey of trying at least, but I suffered for another two years, leading me down to a place where I was homeless. I was 86th from a homeless shelter, so I was super homeless, not even able to go into the homeless shelter and eat. They kicked me out. And so I'm totally alone. I'm going to 12-step meetings twice a day. I'm going to church every Saturday, every Sunday. I'm going to Bible study every Tuesday. I'm going to my probation officer, unannounced, high out of my mind, begging him to put me in prison because I can't stop using. There was no treatment for me. There was no real help for me. And I think that part of my story is that's kind of that has to change. That has to change because I'm a very lucky one. A very small percentage of us in those situations find recovery. So I'm homeless. I've been going to these meetings and doing all this stuff for for months and I can't stop using. And this one day on November 7th, I had used on November 6th. And on November 7th, it was a Tuesday. 
right before Bible study, I'm sitting in this car that this girl let me borrow and it wasn't stolen, but uh, I did have to start it with a screwdriver. So that's just how we lived back then. But I'm sitting in this car before this Bible study and I have this realization that I have literally tried everything available to me to quit using. I, there's nothing I can do. And I sat back in that chair, in that seat, and I said audibly to God, I'm done. I'm not going to this Bible study. I'm not going to church. I'm not going to these meetings. I'm done. Please just let me die. And <clears throat> I'm choking up a little bit because it's, it was so, in that moment, I was so honest. I, I really wanted him to kill me. I didn't want this life anymore. And he whispered to me in that moment and went, it was like this soft whisper, not an audible one from behind me, but this soft whisper that went into my heart. And he said, it's time, go. And right when he said that, I got, the first thing I felt was anger because what's different about this time? What's different about this time than all the other times that I've said I'm never going to use again, dumping my dope in a toilet and flushing it down the toilet. You could have, you could have strapped me to a lie detector test and it would have said I was telling the truth that I'm never going to use again. But then I wake up in the morning and I pawn my TV to go get dope. What's different about this time, God? Exactly. So I, I start hitting the steering wheel. I'm hitting the roof of the ceiling and I'm screaming at him and I'm crying and then he get, lets me get all this out because I'm going at this for minutes. And then when I calm down, he just repeats himself. And he said, it's time, go. And I didn't get this like overwhelming sense of Holy Spirit power. He's done it. It's done. But I got this sense of willingness that I had never had before. Because all these times, all these meetings I had gone to, all these church meetings and all these Bible studies and all this stuff that I had been doing to that point was completely in my control. I made the plans. I grasped onto these plans. I was saying, I'm going to figure this out, how to stop. And none of it was working. But in that moment when he said, it's time, go, I said, fine. Whatever you say, whatever you say, whatever you tell me to do, whatever you put in my path, I'm going to do. So I go to that Bible study. I bust in the doors. I'm 12 minutes late. They're in the middle of prayer and I interrupt them and I throw my hands up and I say, guys, please help me. I can't stop. I can't stop. I used again. My best friend, Brendan, calls me down. He says, hey, bro, let's just get through Bible study. And uh, he gets me through Bible study. And at the end, they pray for me. It was basically like a third step prayer, just, you know, giving my giving my life over to God and, and surrendering. And I remember that time was different from all the times I'd gone to meetings and, and fellowships and different things, because I wasn't throwing my hands up and surrender to a pastor or a church or a Bible study or a fellowship. I was throwing my hands up and surrender to God saying, I can't do this without you. And I left that Bible study. I made it five days. I was craving, I was shaking, you know, mm -hmm. but I wanted to stop so bad. And my best friend, Brendan, took me to IHOP, which is International House of Pancakes. And we're sitting there at breakfast and uh, I get a text message on my phone and it's from my dope dealer. He's like, hey, bro, I just got some st new stuff. It's fire. I'll give you a free 20 to try out. Right when I read that, I felt the spirit go in through the top of my head all the way through my body. My toes were tingling. My fingers were tingling. I lost my peripheral vision. All I could see was my phone and then my thumbs just started texting back. And it wasn't like King James. It was like, ye shall not text me again. Thou hast texted me for the last time. It was going crazy. And then at the end of the text, it said, and fear the pain you cause your son because your son has been blessed with the Holy Spirit. And then whew, feel the spirit leave me. I was like, what the heck? I'm like reading this. And then I show it to Brendan. I was like, dude, that was not me. I was like, I did not write that. I don't know what the heck that was. And you have to imagine like my best friend is completely clean and sober and some kid that has, you know, five days clean and sober is showing him a phone saying, I didn't write that, dude. I didn't write that. And then I push send. I close the phone because I just had this little flip phone. And I'm putting it in my pocket. I'm like, dude, I don't know what that was. And I look back up and Jesus is sitting across from me. The entire restaurant had completely disappeared. All I could see was his face. There was a glow coming from behind him and he was smiling at me. And the only thing I can compare that moment to is when I used to shoot up heroin. Because in that moment, it was as if all my problems, all my worries, all my thoughts, all my negative emotions, everything just flooded out of me. 
with one warm rush into me. But the difference between when I would shoot up heroin and make that happen to this moment was instead of only everything negative being emptied from me, everything positive you can possibly imagine flowed into me in an instant. It was as if unlimited purpose, a certain value, a a meaning to my life, peace, love, all flowed into me. And this all happened in less than a second. I knew who he was. I knew what was happening. I fell with my face to the table, my hand up. I said, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Came back up and he was gone. And in that moment, the cravings, the withdrawals, the obsession, that stuff didn't leave me. Even though in my faith and my belief, I believe that he has the power to do that. Didn't happen like that for me. For the next 20 days, I was shaking with withdrawals, shaking, sick. Um, I, I needed drugs really bad. And uh, the only thing that helped me in that time, the only thing that relieved the obsession and the cravings during that time, the only time I got a break from them was when I would sit down and I would do the work of the 12 steps. My sponsor came and picked me up every morning at 6.30 a.m. And we would go to the movie theater that he managed. We would go in the basement and we would read the big book together and just do what it said. And you know how they say, like, you got to look for a sponsor that you want to be like someone that has what you ha- want to have and things like that, you know? Mm. And that's what that was my problem for seven years in the fellowship was I was looking for Mr. King AA sponsor, the guy with the nice truck and the guy with the hot wife. And I was sponsored by a celebrity for a little bit, but none of that was working. The man that ended up sponsoring me had never sponsored somebody before had just under two years of sobriety, had never tried a drug before, had only drank alcohol, and he was a gay man. So what he had for me that saved my life, for any sponsors out there, was love and time. And he was willing to give them both to me, unconditionally. So we we were going through the work, and on day 25, I did my first ever fifth step. We went up to the rims of Billings, Montana, and I I read in my fifth step and I looked over it. And when I was finished and I was like, what do you think of me now? Because I just I just shared things that I'd never shared with anybody. And he just said, I think you're amazing. I think that's incredible. I'm honored to be part of this, you know, and, and he was just he was super grateful in that moment. But nothing super miraculous happened that day. But the next day, 630 a.m., He comes and picks me up in his 1983 mailman Jeep. We're driving to the movie theater and I'm looking over at this beautiful sunrise. And for the first time in my life, since I was 12 years old, I had no desire to drink or use. And it hasn't returned since that day. (laughs) Beautiful, 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 beautiful. I'm so pleased for you that that you had such a uh, literally miraculous first steps into sobriety and then into your recovery and it is it's amazing um i'm i'm jealous because jesus christ hasn't touched my life yet and nowhere close to to where where you have been and as you quite rightly say the chances of you in the state that you were homeless, etc., that all these things actually that you turn out to be a guest on my show is I don't know. It's probably like yeah. winning lottery. That is probably <laughs> uh, maybe only a mild exaggeration. So I'm blown away. But if I look at that, there are so many truths in there and so many facts that apply to virtually all addicts. Mm. it denial is such a huge thing um so many of us before we even get anywhere close to where you were um for a long time we deny that anything is wrong with us no me i'm an alcoholic me alcoholic no never <laughs> joe over there should look how he drinks but not me <laughs> so as that the hiding the double life that you were living you were a high functioning addict um mm. That is stressful to the max because mm. you're hiding that you want to buy. You're hiding that you're buying. You're hiding the drugs. You're hiding using the drugs. You're hiding 
that you are drunk or completely out of it. You're a full-time hider. God, yeah. it is. I spend a lot of time doing exactly that. How did you manage that? How did you manage to do the sales and still keep going? Yeah, it had a lot to do with. Um, it had a lot to do with the drugs. Honestly, they were my they were my solution. I and it didn't last very long where I was able to hide. Right. And, you know, I find out even later on um, that when I thought I was hiding, people knew people knew. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, one day I'm coming in and I have like a glow about me, you know, because I'm withdrawing. And when you're withdrawing, you don't have the drugs in you, you have a different glow. And then the next day, my eye, one eye is going this way and the other eye is going this way. And I'm looking you in the eyes. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's kind of obvious sometimes, especially yeah. when you're spending a lot of time with certain people. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they not drop you? Why did they not... Was it a pure money thing or did they you know, actually look out for you? You know, it was different in many different situations. At, at one point I had a huge friend group. I was well known in the, in the community that I was in. Uh, I was able to go VIP to all these different um, parties and things and be on stage with really high name DJs and things like that. And then, uh, And I even lived with some people that ran some companies in that industry. But as soon as they found out, they found heroin in my, in my house and they knew it was mine. And then they told everybody and I was completely ostracized from that entire community. Everybody cut me off. Nobody was talking bizarre, anymore. Which is bizarre because especially in that community, uh, people are using left, right and center. They're just using right. different things. Alcohol is right. a given for breakfast and then a bit of cocaine and whatever uppers or downers are, are in there. It's just interesting that they, that the heroin was the, the deal breaker. Um, right. What hypocrisy, um, right. ultimately. Okay. And it, it was painful. It was painful. I think that, you know, And there's a there's a big TED talk out and Johan Ari talks about it a lot about the opposite of addiction is human connection. Oh. Right. And but the problem is, is that we were we were taught through different television programs like intervention and things like that, that we have to cut the addict off. Uh. We have to let them hit rock bottom, you know, but rock bottom is a myth. It doesn't exist for addicts. There is no rock bottom until we stop digging. Or somebody has to dig a grave for us. Yep. You know? That's interesting. It's interesting. And I'm I'm flipping over the fence. I'm sometimes I'm sitting on the fence, sometimes in one camp, sometimes in the other. Because at the same token, for such a long time, um, I mean for decades, I used alcohol as a solution to my problems. I used mm -hmm. alcohol to numb myself, to escape from my reality, to numb my trauma, to numb my yeah. pain. And I, without actually having come to a point where I was so sick and tired of being sick and tired, and for other people to recognize that and then staging the intervention that, that I needed, I ended up in rehab for four weeks, um, that was I needed that journey down until I hit a, a point where I was ready to admit yeah. that I was no longer in control and that I'm powerless. Yeah. So um, when you say that rock bottom is a myth, how do you see the steps, the successful steps to recovery occurring? When should they occur? If it's specifically heroin, um, there is medical, medically necessary ways to get off of it. And in most cases, in almost all cases, because the success rates are, are so slim with opiates that they need some kind of medical help, not just psychiatry and things like that, although that all helps. But the number one thing that opiate addicts are super afraid of to stop is the uh, withdrawals, 
because they're so bad. They're so hard. Um, but the, the myth is that an addict will hit rock bottom and then find recovery, you know, and I had so many times in those seven years that I was trying to stop where I was at a rock bottom. I thought it was rock bottom after that community kicked me out of it. And I was in an apartment all alone in this like cracked in apartment. Mm. And I wrote a little suicide note on an iPad and loaded up a shot with everything I had that absolutely should have killed me and then put it in my arm and then woke up in the, in like 12, 14 hours later in the morning, hanging over the couch with the needle still in my arm, with my arm completely asleep, yelling at God, you know, why am I still here? Why? But that wasn't got deeper from there. Then I thought it was rock bottom when, you know, I got, I got ostracized from one of the companies because after that overdose happened, you know, I, this, the, the installer said that he'll never work with me again, you know? And so I thought that was rock bottom. Then I thought it was rock bottom when I was in a homeless shelter looking around at what my life had become. And then I thought it was rock bottom when I got 86 from the homeless shelter, you know, the rock bottom doesn't exist. It's what the addict right now makes it because the only place that rock bottom actually happens is death or your decision. That's it. It gets worse wherever you are if you continue using the drugs, period. That is that is the best explanation I've heard. And I 100% agree with you there. It's basically redefining our goalposts, redefining um, how we look upon things. Because you're quite right, uh, social media and television and you know the powers to be out there they they play us certain films and that is supposed to be how it looks like um 28 days or or there are a number of of of, of descriptions and and stories about recovery out there and they're all quite romantic but i think what you have just described is absolutely full stop the point it is it is very bloody good and the reason why the reason why I believe in that is I've sponsored many people, many yeah. men and one female in recovery, into recovery. And each one of their bottoms was so different. And they absolutely each one of them could have continued using. You know, I've sponsored someone that was on the streets using meth and, you know, injecting meth and was at a place where I was very similar. But then I've also sponsored someone that was in engineering college that was using too much cocaine and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And he was worried about where it was taking him because he was waking up in the morning, not remembering what happened and feeling shameful. Now, if he didn't decide at that point to recover, mm -hmm. what would have his rock bottom been? If I wouldn't, if he wouldn't have asked me to sponsor him and we didn't do the work together, mm -hmm. where would have that gone? And the answer is, we don't know because rock bottom doesn't exist. If you have an opportunity to help someone, help them now. And if you're out there struggling, mm. get help now mm. because it doesn't get better. And there's no way to manage drugs like this. Mm. There's no way to recreationally smoke a little bit of crack. You can't do that. <laughs> nope. Nope. Oh, I hear you. I hear you, brother. And that is the that is the fact, though. It is we keep forgetting that hate the addiction, love the addict. Um, mm. Ultimately, we are human people. We are we are people who have often had so much trauma in our lives, where alcohol or drugs or certain behaviors, such gambling or or sex addiction, etc. It becomes a a oh, a resolve, a uh, something that that really gives you that bit of peace that you're missing in your life, that bit of serenity, that bit of release. Um, and it is hard for, for those people out there who have never been in, in such a, in such a body to feel the pain and then to feel that, that literally like a painkiller, but more than that, you described it beautiful with the oxycodone. Um, it was taking all your pain away, literally physically, but also mentally 
It was mm -hmm. it was all the worries dropped away. The anxiety was gone. It's that kind of feeling that often our our behaviors and our choices as addicts give us. It's not because we like a poison. It's not because we like to actually pawn your television or steal money or whatever it is in your particular life. It, the, the drug serves a very powerful need. It serves, yes. I mean, the, your, your, that release of anxiety is as important for you as breathing and drinking water and eating. And that is the same level. And that is what many yeah. people uh, don't understand. And when Nancy Reagan said, just don't do it uh, in mm. the 80s, I'm not so sure that that, <laughs> that any addict in, uh, say, in their insane mind or sane mind uh, would actually right. say, yeah, sure, sure. You just don't do it. Okay, all heck right. all. So Let's just stop. Yeah, right. Yeah. Bullshit. All right. Oh, and God. they've actually seen studies about that that specific campaign and the dare project that came out of that. Yeah. And some studies actually say that that might have caused more damage than it wow. did good. Because when you have police officers and people coming into, you know, elementary schools with a briefcase of all the drugs that are available, and then they tell you what they do. And then they say, just say no. What happens when you tell a 10 or 11 year old boy, don't do this. A Ooh, large percent of them it. are like, let's do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Interesting. Good point. I was not aware of that, but I'm not surprised about what you're telling me there. So now that is, we have got different ways. But how do you approach an addict? I mean, there's, let's, let's look at it from, from the angle of the loved one, the parent. What were your parents doing? Were they trying to help? And why were they not successful? They didn't know the extent of it until I was already an adult and gone. And my mom, you know, for a while would call me and worry and ask me about my drug use and th things like that. And it got to a point where I just cut her off with that kind of communication. I was like, if you want to keep talking, you have to stop asking me about it because I don't want to lie. And I don't want to just be shamed about it all the time. You know, and it was no fault of hers. She loved me. You know, my family was always there. They were always there. They were always available. They were always willing to help, you know, but they're just there is there's a very strong lack of knowledge for families. And a lack of awareness for them as well, because this is not just one person's disease. My entire family was deeply affected by my addiction. So they wanted me to recover as bad as probably worse than I did at certain points, you know. So I think that the way to approach an addict is dependent on their age. And I tell I tell parents of addicts this all the time. The first thing when I get reached out to about, about their son or daughter is I ask how old they are. Because if they're in your house and they're under 18, you have a small window of time where you need to be a parent and not a friend. You need to be a disciplinarian and not a friend. That means taking every single power you have to put them in programs, in treatment, in mm. therapy, whatever it is that you can put them in, in that moment, take your power and do it because you don't want to have that time when they're 19, 20 years old, living out there on the streets, wondering what you could have done. Oftentimes, when you go at that, it might not work as the, when they're a kid. It might not, it might. Mm. But you don't want to have that thought, what if I would have? Mm. You want to do everything you can at that time. When they're adults, my, my strong suggestion to everybody that has an addict who's suffering is keep in communication with them and just tell them how much you love them. Ask them about their life. Don't ask them about their drug use. Don't ask them about their addiction. Don't ask them about crimes or if they're, if you know, those kinds of things. Don't bring up a trauma cycle to where they think that every time they talk to you, it's, it's causing harm. Because that makes it so that it's more difficult for them to talk to you when they want to stop. And if you continue to support them with love, care, 
and everything with boundaries. Don't ever let an addict take advantage of you. Don't don't be giving them money. Don't, you know, let them live in your basement if they're going to be overdosing down there and stuff like that. But constantly shower them in love. So when the time comes, when they are completely alone, they don't know who to go to, but they want to stop, they can go to you and they feel confident to go to you and say, hey, I really want to stop. And then you guys can come to a plan. Beautiful. Beautiful. And in all fairness, I mean, it was the love that my wife showed me that one morning uh, when I finally agreed um, to make the changes. It was the love that convinced me, that completely disarmed me. Had she said, ah, I hate the way you're using, I would have said, yeah, it's because of you I'm using. <laughs> oh, yeah, <exactly. laughs> no. <laughs> and it, it actually worked. It was the love that I experienced and that gave me the the final push. Yeah. Um, I guess I, I deep inside I was ready, but I was afraid. I was full of shame, yeah. full of guilt. I thought there was no hope for me. There was yeah. no help for me because I simply, thats that was my core belief. And that was what I thought was true. Nothing could be further from the truth. And yeah. I know that now, but not when you're in the darkness. So that love is of such paramount importance. Yeah. Absolutely. Couldn't it be more? Yes. What can we do to prevent ourselves ending up in that story? I mean, does not virtually every addiction start with trauma? I mean, we can't just, you know, uh, talk about, about successful recovery without actually addressing the traumas that lead to our need to escape reality. How yeah. do we deal with that? What is the chicken? What is the egg? How do you and that's a, that's an interesting question. And this is something I speak on because I do believe that for, you know, a very large percentage, actually it's exactly 67% of addicts who go to deep addiction with hard drugs had some kind of serious childhood trauma. That's 67%. Yeah. But a third, about 33% of us didn't have that kind of thing happen. So I think the the number one way to prevent kids is watching their influence, being really, really, you know, inside of the influence. And that doesn't mean like control them, not go here and not go here and not go here. But that means you have a relationship with the parents of their friends. Just have a relationship to where you guys have an open conversation. You guys are talking about this. Right. Hey, how's this is going? You know, and you have this like community built around it. And then you always have that discussion open with the kids. Right. And when it comes to trauma, okay, I've, I have heard the worst of the worst stories with what I do for trauma. And it's, and it's crazy because I, I heard a new one yesterday that I'd never heard and a new one the day before mm -hmm. that I'd never heard. And the way that I the way that I coach in sharing your traumas so that people can relate, because not everybody can relate to, you know, being human trafficked for six years and, you know, have and being forced to have abortions at 17 because it was the pimp that got you, you know, pregnant. Not everybody can can relate to that specific thing happening. But when we talk about that event, we talk about the way that we felt, the way it made us think about ourselves, our identity. That kind of thing is relatable because almost every trauma causes the same kind of internal battle mm -hmm. with an addict, with someone that is going through that. And if you're out there and you're, you're struggling and you have those kinds of traumas, you have traumas maybe that you've never shared with anyone, you are not alone. I have heard a story that is very similar to yours, if not the exact same. And the thing is, is that when you find someone, you, you have to start sharing it now. I shared that story of, of uh, Chuck, the truth about it, the truth about his suicide with a random heroin dealer, a random street heroin dealer for my first time about 18, 19 months before I actually found recovery. And that actually opened the door for me to be able to start 
start releasing myself, start being okay with who I am. And that doesn't mean in that moment, it was all gravy. That meant that I had finally told the truth. I had finally let it out and the process began. And there's also this, okay? And if you've been through traumas and you're going through addiction now, I, I, I love you, period. I know people who went through horrible childhood trauma that never use drugs. So are we going to allow that POS that molested us when we were four years old control our life for the rest of our life? I won't. I will not let something that has happened to me control my life for the rest of my life. Mm. And if you're out there, you are not at fault. You are not to blame for what happened to you when you were a kid. Right now, you have a responsibility to recover, to be open, and to move past that in a powerful way because there are so many other people out there that are struggling with the same thing. They had that childhood trauma that they they feel like they can't tell anybody about. They feel shamed about it. They feel like it's their fault. They feel like they're they're worthless. And when you share your story and they hear you and how it made you feel, how it made you think, they will relate to you. And when you've overcome and you share with them how you've overcome, they will be able to follow suit. Wow. But that is, it, it sounds so bizarre when you're in the depth of the darkness. Yet the moment you spell it out, one of the most powerful moments that I ever had in my life is when I was sitting the first time in a, an AA setting and said, hi, I'm Stefan, I'm an alcoholic. I knew it for years beforehand, the moment it left my lips, it was as if a dam was broken. Mm. Thereafter, it was said once, now there was the release there, and I could now suddenly talk about it. It was such a tiny little step, yet this step of speaking out can be so powerful. Now, there are not always the right places to speak out, but you can put things into words without speaking. You can write things down, the journaling, to actually literally write your story down, that might be a huge start for your own recovery. And that's yes. if you're if you're still full of such of shame and guilt, and you, it's in, unfathomable that you even speak to someone, write things down. It's a start yeah. because suddenly it's there. You have actually you've dealt with a taboo, something that you were hiding. You're no longer hiding. It's there in front of you. Yes. So you made the first step. You took action. And now the next step will be much easier. You might yeah. go to your doctor, to your family physician, and actually say, look, I think I've got a problem. And that's often the very best thing to do. Because if you're like me, I mean, I'm for crying out, I'm a doctor. So I should have known everything. And I guess I, I knew a lot of things, and I could diagnose them in others, but I could not diagnose things in me. I also right. uh, knew what was around me. I had no clue about the services that were available for addicts in my area, in my within my reach. No idea. Um, because that was not something that you look out for. It's the same for you. So you think, no, 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 I'm I'm all there's no hope, no help. There, there's no help out there. Bullshit. There's probably at any one time there are people out there that you have no clue that they've gone through the same trauma as you and who are more than happy and more than willing yes. to help you because they are now, they have gone through their own cycle of, of trauma and healing and are now at a point where they are giving back to society, where they're giving back and, and, and speaking out and telling their stories. Yes. For me, anger and resentment was a huge, huge, huge issue that stopped me. For me, anger, it was, and in, in all fairness, a lot of shit had happened to me um okay yes you could argue a lot about me being maybe a cause of the things that happened to me but in my mind of course now look what they have done to me ha mm. i gonna show you i'm gonna drink a whole bottle of whiskey now ha that will show you 
<laughs> what the fuck? I mean, did you, how was anger and resentment in your life? You seem to have it all together now, but how was it? How were these emotions when you were actually uh, sort of, you know, let's say that last two years of your addiction? Yeah. Um, I'm going to touch on one thing right before that. If you're out there and you're struggling and you're you're at a place where you need to ask for help, what you may not know is that the people that are there to help you are helped more by helping you than any kind of help you can possibly get from them. So you reaching out for help will actually help the person that helps you. It's very paradoxical in this community. The people that have found recovery mm -hmm. have to help people find recovery in order to keep their life in recovery. So never feel ashamed to reach out for help. And when I was, you know, at the end, I don't, I don't remember ever having anger towards anybody else. I just had this, this serious anger and resentment and hate of myself mm -hmm. because I knew where I came from. I knew the potential I had, and I knew that I was jamming it away with a needle in my arm. And, you know, my resentments, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of people do a lot of horrible things to me. You know, I didn't have a bunch of experiences where, you know, people harmed me, except for, you know, things that I could justify for them. Like when that community kicked me out, mm. the identity that I had was that I'm not worthy. I'm not I'm not worthy of that community. I'm not worthy of that love. So I wasn't angry at them. I always internalized it in myself. I always said, you know, well, if they can't love me, then I'm unlovable. Mm. If, if that person fires me, then I'm not valuable. Mm. And if I'm doing this stuff over here, if I'm sticking needle in my arm over here, how could God possibly love me or want to hear from me? You know, how could, and, and I always had this faith that, that, that I loved God, that I, I never lost faith that I believed in God. Right. But I had this, this, this long season of life where I didn't believe that he could possibly love me. And when that changed, my life changed. When I realized that, you know, there was, there was never a point in my addiction, my recovery, or now that he loved me any more or less. And something that happened that, that actually you know, proves that to me, at least, is in 2016, before I found recovery, it was actually at the very beginning of 2017. I was working for one of those door to door sales companies, I had corporate housing, they paid for the housing and everything. And I was sitting at my desk in my corporate housing apartment. And I in my drawer, in my desk, I had all my all my shit in it, my dope and my syringes and stuff. And I just loaded up a syringe. And I was looking at it. And I was thinking and I like, I, I realized that I didn't want to do it, but I had to. Mm. And it's a really weird place to be. And if you haven't experienced it, it's impossible to feel. But looking down at this loaded syringe, I started crying. And I remember the way that it looked magnified and blurry through the tears in my eyes. This thing that was taking everything from my life, but I still had to do it. And I set it down on the desk and I put my face in my hands and I started crying and I heard a voice and this voice actually came from behind me and it said, pray. And I looked behind me and there was no one there. And I put my face back in my hands and I started crying deeper and deeper. And then I heard it repeat itself and it said, pray. And I got up from my desk and I limped over to my bed, not from physical pain, but from emotional pain from all the things that I'd been through. And I dropped down on my knees and I put my hands up in the air and all I could get out through the pain was God. And in that moment, I felt arms wrap up from behind me and hug me as if to say, I love you. And these weren't arms coming from someone that was standing above me, like all the other people in my life, patting me on the shoulder saying, you're all right, dude, you'll make it through. But these were arms of someone that had gotten down on the ground with me and hugged me and said, I'm here with you in your lowest point, And I love you in this moment. And that was at the depth of my addiction, at the depth. So if you're out there, and you're struggling, you are worthy, you are valuable. And everything about you right now is perfect, and loved by God. There's nothing you can do 
to change that fact. What would you say to people who have not been touched by Jesus Christ, who maybe have got a history where the church has mm. been instrumental in their trauma? Mm. How can we bring love and understanding and help to people who recoil but it's just the sheer fact that you name Jesus or, or God. Yeah. And I, I sincerely, sincerely apologize for any wounds and any trauma that a man-made religion did to anybody here. Mm. And I am not a religious person. Mm. I'm, I'm not somebody that says I have to do this, 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 and this in order to get this. I have a relationship with God through Jesus personal to me, personal to me. And anybody out there that has been wounded by the church has been wounded by these people. I, I get it. I personally have been also I had to leave the Catholic Church when I was in seventh grade, because I just I just couldn't do it anymore. And the difference between having a relationship with God, and following a religion, is that it's personal to you. And if you can, if you can separate man and God, you will have a, a very different outlook on the personal relationship that you're able to have. Mm -hmm. I am very aware that men that say that they're Christians or men that say that they're Muslims or men that say that they're this or that aren't necessarily in relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Any man is able to use something to dominate. Any man is able to twist something, twist truth in order to manipulate other people. Absolutely. But what cannot be manipulated is a personal relationship with God. And a really great way to start is just right by your bed. I have a, I have a mat by my bed, a soft mat that reminds me whenever I wake up and whenever I go to bed, I just get on my knees and just talk to God. That's it. And if there's something fighting against you, to get down on your knees and just say, God, I need you. God, if you're real, will you introduce yourself to me? God, if you're real, I want to know you. You can literally start prayer like that. If you're real, show me. And then be open to him showing you. And fellowship is always great. I, I have fellow Christians that I that I'm mentored by, that I that I talk with and, and stay in fellowship with, but I am very aware when I don't want to be involved with a church because it doesn't, it doesn't jive with what I learn in my personal relationship with God. So anybody out there that's struggling because of something man did, I'm sorry. They do not represent God. And that's beautifully said. But again, what you're actually saying is that you have got you as in the listener out there, the, the guys who are watching this, you have got choices. You've got a privilege to make choices every second in your life. You can choose to actually go down on your knees and give it a shot. You can choose to say, no, this is bullshit. And this is... Yeah. There's nothing wrong with you making one choice or the other. It's the question is, which outcome is more likely to help you in your recovery? And so therefore, but these choices are yours. So therefore, that is very powerful. You're no longer a victim by actually thinking of every moment now as being an option for a choice. Mm. When you do choice, you decide. Decide means to cut off. The, from I think Latin it is. So to decide means you cut off that option and go down that route. Yes. Whatever it is, go down that route and see if that leads you to the person that you truly want to be. Mm. My educated guess is you don't really like that pain that gnaws in mm. you. And you really 
probably are not so proud of the things that you have done in the past. Otherwise, mm. you probably wouldn't listen to a show like that. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Got the T-shirt, vomited on it. Um, so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. We have had our traumas. Some of us more self-inflicted than others. Um, one way or the other, it's a trauma. But that was the past. The past does not equal the future. You can right now decide, okay, who do I want to be when I grow up? It doesn't matter if you're mm -hmm. 17 or 70. Okay. Who do you want to be when you grow up? What kind of woman do you want to be? What kind of man do you want to be? Do you want to show something like leadership, integrity, love to others? Um, I know I do. And I certainly over the last eight years, I've, I've tried to make the right choices. They don't always come easy. Uh, let's put it like that. Um, the problem is trauma comes in layers. Shit mm. comes in layers in your life. And you can't just imagine one day you go to the gym, you lift free weights and you're now fit for life. Yay! <laughs> well, your healing will take the same. Um, Adam, you were referring to the 12 steps. I mean, 12 steps is equally uh, the, the program that I went through and uh, that helped me a tremendous amount. Um, is What do you think about our other programs? Um, is Do you need to go to a 12-step program to get clean? So I was in the 12-step fellowships for seven years, unable to find recovery. If you're going to do it, go in to do the work. Because for people like me, going to meetings every day mm. doesn't work. <laughs> and and you get, that's I also, it. I mean, you go to so many meetings and there are always the same people who are speaking out. And you know exactly. You haven't moved past step one and two. You are. Yeah. That's right. If you are don't, not coming here, you will use. But you haven't done anything else. Right. Mm. Right. And I, I love my fellowships. I, I don't, I'm not a proponent of any specific one. I will go to any one of them and I relate. I qualify for every A that's out there. And I tell people because it is, it is in almost every city, in almost every country in the entire planet, mm. if somebody reaches out from somewhere where I am not, that is where I direct them because that is where I know they can find people that have recovered mm -hmm. so they can start a journey. I absolutely am not of the, of the faith that you have to do the 12 step program in order to recover. I do believe that that set of skills and that set of principles is amazing to learn in order to be able to pass on certain things to other addicts when you recover. I, I have heard stories of many different journeys, many different ways to recover. And the important thing is, and everybody, you know, everybody asks me that has a loved one, you know, what do I need to tell them to do? And I say nothing. Don't ever tell them they need to do anything. Because the interesting thing is that an addict at the end at the very end, if you ask them, do you want to stop? And they say, yes, worse than anything. And then you ask them, what do you think you need to do to stop? The odds of them not having an answer to that are very, very slim. Some of them, you know, may say, I need to go to treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's get you in treatment. Some of them say, you know, I know I need to go to meetings every single day and I need to do the 12 steps. Great. Some of them may say, you know, I need to go down to do Ibogaine treatment, you know, but they have an answer that they, they believe they need to do. And whatever that answer is for you, you can't half ass it. You can't say, I need to go to meetings every day and do the 12 steps and then go to meetings every day and not do the 12 steps. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> If you know the path that you have to take, yeah. you have to dedicate yourself and make a decision to cut off everything else and focus on that thing specifically, at least to see it through. 
at least to see if it would actually work for you. Mm. You can't half-ass it. And again, that is the 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 principle of compound interest. You're actually mm -hmm. taking a little step and another step in the right direction, another step. And after a while, you realize that one and one and one does not make three, it makes five. Um, mm -hmm. Because you're actually getting stronger and stronger. And it is a most beautiful, beautiful experience. So yeah. therefore, guys, don't be afraid to take that first step. And if you've yeah. taken the first step, then look out um, for what is potentially the next step. What else can you do to get yourself stronger, get yourself more towards that human when you look in the mirror that you actually say, okay, you've done some shit in your life, but you got your shit sorted now. That, yeah. that is power. That is mm. that is you putting those demons into the dungeon where they belong. Um, these demons will always be there. Your addiction will always be there. You're, you're not cured of your addiction somehow, some way. But you can be in a position in your life where your addiction is no longer running you, but where you are actually taking active steps literally active intentional steps towards living a better life yes. and the more of these steps you can are able to incorporate in, in the various roles in your life the more power you this new human will will gain it's like feeding a plant with with water and with new uh, with fertilizer etc it needs all that to grow it's the same with the, the the good human in you with the the not addict the opposite to the addict in you um you can feed either that person or you can feed the addict it's your choice amen how how much do things like uh, how much do you look at your own care nowadays uh, do you have a program where you look after yourself that are certain things that you do every day without which you say, no, this is not a good day. 100%. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, recovery step work, necessarily. Mm -hmm. But something that I have been doing since day one of recovery is making my bed every morning. <sighs> it is, it is a fantastic keystone habit. <laughs> yeah, it, it sets me up for the day to make good decisions. If I, I, I don't even think I'm like trying to imagine it. I don't even know if I would be capable of not making my bed now. I don't believe I could leave my house without making my bed now. <laughs> and I also do something I call the list of six every night, yeah. which is I write down six things right before bed that I'm going to do in the morning. Yeah. And what that does, if you do it as a last thing right before you go to bed, your subconscious mind while you sleep begins to plan your next day. And if the first thing on your list is what time you're going to wake up, and when your alarm goes off, you put your feet to the floor, you immediately start your day with a level of confidence and self trust that you can't really muster up from other things. Because you planned it the day before, you stepped out of bed, and you did it. Your first decision of your day was I'm taking control of this day. <laughs> this day is mine to make. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, Adam, man, you you are Wow, um, you really got your shit together now. Um, and <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. well, I know, I know, I know. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm, same here, same here. I absolutely understand where you feel because yeah, I've got my own hesitation because we still got these these funny voices telling us, "Nah, who are you to come onto this show? Who are you to have a show?" You know, yeah. it's all that kind of bullshit that we deal every day with. And it's again, uh, living a healthy lifestyle means to actually. Uh, acknowledge those voices, uh, figure yeah. out where do they come from, and are they are they valid? Is are their points actually valid? And enough, enough, no, it's so much bullshit we are telling ourselves, and we tell us yeah. that bullshit in in a way that is so toxic. You wouldn't talk to your worst enemy the way you talk to yourself, and mm. so please, there's so much where you can learn to just deal with one thing at a time. And by focusing your attention to the now, forget yes. about the past. All right, not forget, but put the past literally behind you. 
you cannot do anything about it. It has occurred, but you can do something about it now. And the future hasn't even arrived yet. But right now, what can you do? Can you drink a glass of water and take a deep breath? Yes, you can. Maybe Amen. that will help your parasympathetic nervous system to kick in. And actually, suddenly your anxiety feels far less of an issue. Um, maybe you just want to empty your bladder and think, oh, shit, I didn't <laughs> realize that I had to piss. <laughs> no surprise, I felt a bit anxious. Um, so, you know, it's, it's little things like that. Just pay attention to the little things. Now, once you've got them sorted and just figure out, are you hungry? Oh, yeah, shit, I haven't had breakfast or, or lunch. That's fine. <laughs> so hungry, angry, lonely, tired, those kind of triggers that we often forget about. You can't strive for the pinnacle of your needs for this serenity without looking at the very bare survival of you. So look at your basis, get your habits established, have some fun and live in the moment whilst you're at it. And if you try to incorporate that and try to do these principles, Every minute, every every half an hour, whenever you can, make that choice. Hey, don't you think that your life within a week, within a month, within a year will be very different? Mm. And listen now, we, we are no longer talking about drugs or alcohol or whatever your behavior was. We're talking about now recovery. And recovery is really living a life that's worthwhile living. And therefore, the need for using becomes less and less. And that is no magic thing. I'm still an addict. There still will be temptations there. And if I'm not careful to, to look after myself, I will go the other way very easily. Yep. So, Adam, you're an amazing man. Um, if people want to learn more about you, where can they go? Yeah, I, uh, I'm actually giving away my book now a digital and audio copy. If they go to from chains to saved.com, they can pick that up. And then if they want to follow me, uh, you can go on Facebook at recovered on purpose. And I do live videos five days a week, I have guests uh, twice a week. And we just have a community there where you know, we're all working on living our life in recovery by helping addicts that are out there suffering. Brilliant. Guys, look down there into the description of the YouTube video or of the podcast. You've got all of Adam's links down there. And honestly, what have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? I mean, just, you know, check him out. Uh, if if what he says rang true with you, certainly did with me, then why not get a book? Why not have a listen? Why, you know, just take action. This is your choice. Live intentionally. Take action and check him out. And once you check him out, well, you might as well take before that, take action down there by pressing the like and subscribe button on the show. Tell your friends another bit of action that you can do. Maybe <laughs> consider, just consider my book, My Steps to Sobriety. Once you have done, once you have finished with Adams, My Steps to Sobriety here, uh, just have a look at that. And already you see there are a lot of ways that you can take action that can lead yeah. you further. And it's the compound interest that you're waiting for. You've taken one step, one step. Hey, that feels good. And suddenly you yeah. do more and you want to do more. And that's cool. And that's exactly recovery. So guys, go out there. Check Adam's workout. Uh, check my workout. Don't stop. Explore paths. One thing might not be right for you. That's fine. You've tried something, didn't work. Try something else. But never stop trying. Never stop moving yeah. forward. Because this is your life. It's worthwhile living. Hey, cool. Yes. Adam, thank you, thank so, you much so much for being a guest on my show. You're a great man. Thank you so much for having me, Stefan. And you guys out there, look after yourself and really live with passion. Bye. Love you guys. Dream on, dream on.